There we go. So it is now recording. So again, welcome everyone. We've got a great panel of experts and parent experts with us tonight to talk about guardianship and the alternatives to guardianship. Um, really appreciate you being here tonight. Uh, we've got an order that we're going to go with, but I'm going to have each panelist introduce themselves and um, let you know a little bit about what they're talking about. Um, bear with us because technology cannot, can sometimes not be our friend. So um, give me a lot of grace and the speakers a lot of grace. If you can't hear something, um, write it in the chat and let us know for sure. And um, so I think tonight we are going to start with Ashley Barlow. So Ashley, I'll let you take it from here. Hey, awesome. I'm going to, um, are we doing introductions first, like everybody and then come back? Um, I, I think we could just have you introduce yourself and then we'll, we'll just have each one introduce themselves. How about okay, that? Perfect. When okay. it's their turn to talk. So question before we do this is Amy was taking the screenshot. My neighbor started cutting their grass. So is my audio okay? I okay. hear you fine. Great. If it doesn't, I'm outside because it's usually the quietest place in my house, but if it's not the quietest place, then just tell me and I will move. There's another spot I can go. Um, so my name is Ashley Barlow and um, what I'm an attorney. Um, the majority of my practice focuses on people with disabilities. So, whoa, I just got big. So I um, do special education support I do um, divorce work and most of my divorces have a child with a disability and then I do estate planning, a lot of special needs estate planning um, and then I came from a general practice and so I can do other things. I just don't really love to do other things. Um, guardianship, I do a little bit of probate work and guardianship is actually probate. The um, most of the guardianship stuff that I do involves really, it's more like a custody thing. So most of the time when I get called in on a guardianship, it's because another attorney represents a parent and the child is getting ready to turn 18, the parents are divorced and they need a place where they can house their um, guardianship agreement and or their custody agreement, um, which is obviously a disservice to a child if we can avoid that, you know? I mean, they, a lot of times people are putting people, putting their children in guardianship because they can't agree on how to care for them or how to help them in their decision making. Um, and so, you know, it's oftentimes a really sad situation when I get involved. Um, but regardless of that, um, I, you know, do guardianship otherwise as well. Um, I don't do a ton of guardianships because if they're uncontested, they are really, really, really easy to do on your own. And I am the kind of attorney that always says like, if I can save you a few thousand dollars, I'd rather save you a few thousand dollars than, um, you know, do something that you really don't need me to do. So lots of times what I do is I consult with people um, on, you know, kind of the decision making. Like, do you want to file a guardianship? And if you do, then, um, you know, here are the decisions that you need to make. And if you don't, here's what supported decision making looks like or whatever. Um, so that's usually how I get involved. So that is who I am. Um, and Amy, it says that my screen sharing is disabled. You wanna make me the host so I can share this PowerPoint? Be happy to. And then is my audio still okay while we're waiting on that? I, I hear you fine, yeah. Okay, sure. it's surprising because it is really loud. And tell me if I'm yelling too, because I might feel like I'm yelling over this. Okay, looks like it changed. All right, so I'm just going to share my screen and then we'll go over to this. Okay, I'm going to move you guys. All right, so today what we're going to talk about, oops, is guardianship. Ah, go away. Okay, maybe I can do it this way. Okay, guardianship and supported decision making. Um, and our order is we're going to talk about guardianship and then we're going to switch to another speaker to talk about um, ways that you can do this through estate planning means like powers of attorney, etc. And then we're going to flip back into this PowerPoint to talk about supported decision making so that you don't hear from me for a long time at the beginning. Um, so what is guardianship is the first question. And so this first point just explains exactly what it is. It's a legal process which is utilized when a person can no longer make or communicate safe and sound decisions about his or her person or property. And as a result of that, they become susceptible to fraud or undue influence. Um, 
I oftentimes start with that question when people come in to me. Um, you know, how do you feel? I break it down into two pieces. Um, medical decision making and decision making about your physical body and then financial decision making. And so my first question is, do you, relative to medical, relative to financial, do you feel like your child would um, still act like you're their mom if you said, no, you have to go get blood work? You know, they're 18 in one day and you say you have to get blood work or you have to go to the dentist or would they have a hard time doing that? Um, and then we kind of walk through, if the, if the answer is, oh yeah, they have a hard time doing that, then we'll kind of walk through from there as to what the next options are. Um, and you know, a lot of times it does lead to guardianship, so a lot of times it doesn't. Um, but then the next question is, would they be susceptible to undue influence? And a lot of people don't really have the, the, um, the forward-facing presence in the adult world yet at age 18 in a day to even be exposed to undue influence. So people think about girlfriends and boyfriends or people in a group home or something like that. And those things might not arise until the person turns 25 or something like that. So you might get seven years of kind of a trial of decision making it before you become susceptible just simply because you can't be exposed to it, um, you know, on your on your bus ride to and from college and at college, that kind of thing um, or employment or wherever that is. So um, the next point is a really important point in the disability community, and that is that because establishing guardianship can remove considerable rights from a person, it should only be considered after the alternatives are considered. So consider the estate planning options, consider supported decision making options before you consider guardianship because it is an, a very um, extreme option. Guardianships can be broken into two categories. So we talk, we can talk about the financial piece, which in Kentucky and a lot of times in Ohio is called a conservatorship, and then the medical personal um, piece, which you know is like the physical custody of the person. And so in all three states, Kentucky, Indiana, and Ohio, which we serve at the DSAGC, um, you can do a limited guardianship. So you can just do a guardianship over the finances, or just do one over the um, medical decision making and personal decisions. Um, what does the ARC say about guardianship? I think this is an important piece because it isn't just us, you know, it's, it's so different to think about this as an advocate in the disability community and then to think about it as a parent. Because as an advocate, you know, we're all saying like, decision making, we should not strip our children, we should not strip people with disabilities of their rights to vote, to get married, to, I've got a slide on all of the rights that are available, but then as a parent, we think, oh my gosh, but they're susceptible to all of the terrible things in the world and, um, you know, all of these risks and the susceptibility, that the risk is so significant, you know, to, to lose everything and to then have a month where you can't afford anything and that's really scary and my God, my child needs so much medical support. Um, and so there's kind of this balance. And so I think it's really important to look to see what do the national organizations say about this. And so what the ARC says is that the appointment of a guardian is a serious matter that involves the limitation of a person's independence and rights. It should only be considered in an effort to protect the welfare of the person. Now, I don't include that to say, gosh, if that's what you've chosen or if that's what you are certain you are going to choose, you've made the wrong decision. But I think it's really important to understand that we need to um, look at those options first if we are um, doing our due diligence, basically. So it's a due diligence slide. Okay, so rights affected by guardianship, guardianship. I should have said this at the beginning. I am a terrible proofreader and I now work by myself. So nobody, this is a new PowerPoint to me. Um, my guardianship PowerPoint that I usually use is a lot longer. So I condensed this for tonight. Um, so there, that's probably not gonna be the only typo and I apologize. Um, so, you know, I think it's important before we really dive into what the process looks like and that, th that sort of thing to think about, well, what are we talking about, right? And so lots of times before we go through this list, I say to parents that we're really looking at parent decisions that a parent makes for a child. Um, and so, um, you know, I get to decide for my, I have two little boys. Oh, I should have started with that. My um, uh, oldest is 13 and he has typical abilities. My youngest is 10 and he has Down syndrome. His name is Jack. So 
um, what does, what do I get to decide for my kids? I get to decide where they go to school. I get to decide where they live. I get to decide, um, you know, if they're going to be allowed to go to college until they turn 18, you know, kind of what their college planning looks like. Um, I get to decide whether or not we're going to get braces. Um, all of those decisions are decisions that I get to make as their parent. Um, so similarly, we think about those for adults, where they're going to live, determine their residence, consent for medical treatment. Um, you know, are we going to have blood work? How often are we going to go for a mammogram? All of those things. Um, end of life decisions, which is a significant thing. Um, possess a driver's license. Now in Kentucky, you can spell that out. You can put somebody under guardianship and you can afford them two options. You can afford them the right to drive and you can afford them the right to marry. Um, you also can do voting. It's a little bit different. Manage, buy, and sell property is um, another one. Are you even allowed to purchase property is another specific um, question in a guardianship own and possess a firearm or other weapon, contract, um, sign contracts or file lawsuits, marry and vote. Those are kind of the big ones that we think about when we're talking about guardianships. So when is a guardianship appropriate? Can we like spell it out into a test for people? Um, I have to move my Zoom block over to the other side so I can read this one. Okay, so it's appropriately generally speaking. I mean, you know, this is just kind of a test for parents because I like things to be black and white. If a person, first of all, lacks the understanding to or the ability to communicate about reasonable personal decisions. If you can check that box, then go on to the next one because they both have to be met in my professional opinion in order to say, yes, a guardianship is appropriate. And it's a person whose behavior indicates that he or she is unable to meet their personal needs for medical, nutritional, clothing, shelter, or safety needs with appropriate technological assistance. So kind of like when we talk about school, we are placed in the least restrictive environment. When we talk about guardianship, we want to try to place a person in the least restrictive environment. And so first, what we're gonna do, just like when we talk about the continuum of placements in special education, in, in the adult world, in our decision-making world as an adult, when we're turned off into the world to be free, um, we think, well, could we support this person with technology? Or, and I would also say with other support, um, will the support work? Will the technology work in order to allow the person to make decisions on their own? Um, so first, ability to communicate, and then second, the, the, um, the behavior that is, and I don't mean behavior like, um, like we talk about bad behavior or behavior problems, I mean like the human behavior in order to meet their um, basic needs. All right, now I gotta move my Zoom block over again. This is when we say be patient with technology. Okay, so what protections are available? You know, as I said, uncontested guardians are really easy to do in court, but oftentimes they're contested because the person um, that is the intended ward or the person over whom a guardianship is sought, um, in our case, the self-advocate with Down syndrome, is opposed to it or some other person in the community is opposed to the appointment of a guardian to the guardianship concept. A lot of times that's a sibling. Um, sometimes it is another parent if it's a divorce situation. Um, I don't think I've ever seen it come from a married situation and I honestly don't even know what the law says about that if you have to agree with your spouse or not um, but you know grandparents community members etc can argue against a guardianship um, so what protections are available obviously the self-advocate has notice of the proceedings so they have to be served a copy of anything that gets filed and that way they understand that something is happening um, they do get represented by an attorney, so they get um, legal counsel. Most of the time, families just let the court appoint a guardian ad litem. That is a person that is um, appointed by the state to represent the child um, that is into, or the adult, depending on the age. A lot of people do this at, you know, 17 and um, 10 months in order to get it started. 
attendance of the individual at hearings and court proceedings, the, the intended ward or the person over whom the guardianship is intended is invited to the court hearings and I think should be at the um, hearings. A lot of times they aren't. Ability to compel, confront, and examine witnesses. I mean, you know, they've got an attorney if they want to um, cross-examine or bring any witnesses, they can. And we'll talk about the process and like why they, why they might want to do that. They can obviously present evidence um, and then they can file an appeal if they disagree with the decision of a court in one direction or another. Um, the standard of proof is clear and convincing evidence. And then they have a right to a trial by jury. So that's what, that's what that is. Okay. So what's the process then? How does this look? I think that's where most parents are most um, kind of nervous or anxious if they've decided they want a guardianship. It's like, well, I have no idea what this is. I've never gone to court. I don't understand what court is. Um, unlike divorce, and in, in, in Ohio, if you get divorced, you do have to go to court at some point. In Kentucky, if you get divorced, you don't have to go to court anymore. Um, and so there's a lot of people that are even divorced that have never been to court. Um, and so with a guardianship, you do have to go to court because this is so serious. So courts actually want to see the, the people. They want to kind of get a vibe for everything. They want to see the evidence. They want to hear the experts testify. Um, but it's pretty streamlined. So what happens kind of generally, depending on Kentucky, Indiana, and Ohio, I made this as, as broad as I could, um, is you apply by filing something called a petition or a complaint, depending on your state, for guardianship. And you do that in probate court. Um, in, um, I guess it doesn't even matter to say where, where it is county by county because we serve so many counties in Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana as well. But um, you would go to the probate court. You can look it up on the internet. The petition is available in, I don't know about Indiana because I'm not licensed in Indiana, but in Kentucky and Ohio, you can get them online. They're forms. You don't need to come up with something out of your brain or off the internet. Um, and you fill it out. Then there is a filing fee that you pay when you do that. Um, and like something I would say between all three states, you would expect it to be less than $300. Um, and then there is a series of evaluations. So um, the evaluations are done by experts. Normally we have a social worker that does an evaluation about kind of adult decision making. So um, there's a question about like, giving change. You know, you walk into the store and you have a $5 Coke and a $10, um, that's an expensive Coke, a $5 Coke and a $10 sandwich. How much is it? It's $15. If you pay with a $20 bill, how much money would you expect to get back? $5. Um, that sort of thing. So there's that kind of decision making. There's some decision, there's some questions about activities of daily living. Um, there are questions about transportation and just kind of checking almost if you if you could qualify at all it's it's like um, readiness for adult independent life um, then they will want a, an expert opinion a report by a medical doctor normally you just go to your own uh, medical doctor and have them fill something out and they're usually very used to doing that um, and then there's a psychologist that will do some psychological testing, not necessarily cognitive testing, but psychological testing to, um, again, assess the child's or the person's readiness for um, independent adult life. Then once all those are in, and usually if there's a delay, the delay is in waiting for those things to be turned into the court. Once those are in, then the court will schedule it for a, for a hearing. If any of those are like, they will make a recommendation, yes or no to guardianship. So if any of those are contrary to your position, if you're a parent and you're applying for guardianship and somebody says, I don't think this, this person needs a guardian, um, then you probably want to talk to that expert prior to the hearing. But normally it all kind of, they all get turned in very easily. Um, then you attend the trial or the hearing. Um, I guess technically they're all trials and it's a two-part thing. First is the guardianship warranted. If all the experts say yes and there's nobody there to contest it, then it's a slam dunk, it's easy peasy. Um, and then the second one is who should be appointed as the guardian. And I looked at that sentence a hundred times because I was like, is that the subject or the direct object? And now I'm thinking, it's no, it's it's a is it a predicate nominative? It's does anybody know because 
put it in the chat because it's bothering me now. I think it is still supposed to be who. Um, but wh who is the person? <laughs> what is the person? I don't want to say who. Um, that should be appointed the guardian. A lot of times this is where parents argue. If one, you know, if they're divorced, um, they might argue about it. You can be co-guardians. Um, sometimes siblings argue about it. Sometimes, you know, in big families, there might be five that want to be co-guardians, but they want to leave somebody out, and that person wants to be a part of decision making for their sibling. That part can get a little hairy, um, but once you know a guardianship is going to occur, then that um, messiness kind of turns more into like a divorce situation or a probate situation um, otherwise. So that is um, the process. Then you look at what the guardian has to do, um, which, you know, I like to set my clients on the path of um, kind of a lifelong obligation. Um, and so it's not like, okay, here's your paper, here's your order, get on with, um, get on with your life. So obviously, if you are the guardian of somebody, you first, number one, are caring for that person's physical welfare, their food, clothing, housing, all of the things that we talked about, all of those decisions, now you're making them, just like you do for a child. You are guardian of your minor child. Um, so it's the same kind of decision making. Then you also have to maintain a current understanding of that. So when I write estate plans, what I say about choosing a guardian, I go ahead and put a guardian in all of my special needs estate plans, even if somebody says that they probably won't pursue guardianship because things can change, right? Like I might need a guardian because I might have a stroke. I might sustain a traumatic brain injury, something like that. But the chances of my Jack needing a guardian are more significant because of his cognitive impairment and his profile. Um, and so I do recommend, even if you aren't considering it, that you do put it in your estate plan. And when I talk about a guardian to uh, my estate planning clients, what I say is the number one thing that the guardian needs to be able to say is no. Because adults with um, cognitive impairments, adults that are not capable of making decisions for themselves, oftentimes are really, really persistent and can get um, almost argumentative, and in some cases definitely argumentative, about the decision making. And so the easiest way to say no is if you have information. No because. You know, read parenting books and they say, don't just say no, say no because. No, I'm turning my kids into attorneys because I say no because, and then if I just say no, then they're like, but why? And they want to have a 20-minute discussion. So maybe I should have just said no. Um, but I think, you know, you can't say no to an adult with a whole lot of authority unless you understand those needs. Um, so being an out-of-town guardian of a sibling or something like that would be significantly more different. I think weekly check-ins or daily check-ins are um, certainly more warranted than like a monthly check-in. Um, you do, a guardian does have to file an annual report with the court and that has um, mostly financial information in it. The guardian is responsible for protecting the assets of the person in favor of using government funds to the greatest extent possible. So we have to use social security proceeds, we have to use Medicaid as much as possible because, you know, you've got a fiduciary duty to um, protect the assets of the person. A lot of people ask me when I'm going through this with clients, well, does that mean that I can't um, that I could become personally liable? And the answer to that is only if you act completely unreasonably. So your personal assets as the guardian are not accessible um, if there's like a lawsuit or something. But if you, you know, you could be sued in your capacity as a guardian if you waste away the, the ward's assets, the, the person, um, the other person's assets. Um, number five, maximize the independence of the person. That is still an interest, just like it is at school. You know, we have to um, try to keep the person as independent as possible. And then, and like, you know, there are usually non-parent cases, but there are cases that are just so egregious where the guardian, um, you know, wants the, the person in their basement all the time and they have complete control over them. And there's this like really sad, brainwashing kind of thing. I mean, that's what that really speaks to. It's not like you have to feel this burn all the time that you didn't work on speech or that you didn't um, work on accessing the, the public transportation or something like that. Um, 
And then number six is obviously to respect the rights of the person, um, which is the primary concern at all times. And um, again, you know, in order to breach that, it would have to be extremely egregious. So that is kind of an overview of guardianship. I'll give you a sneak peek because what we would go into next is um, supported decision making and whoops and the probate um, options like I'm sorry the estate planning options like powers of attorney etc. Um, I know we're gonna do questions at the end, so I think I'm ready. Unless you have any other suggestions, Amy, I think I'm ready to. Yeah. I think we're ready for Emily now, right? Do you want to um, unshare your screen? Here we go. Thank you. Emily, you ready? Yes. Good evening, everyone. My name is Emily Pan, and thank you so much for having me present to all of you today. This is my first time um, being part of this teens group, and so thank you so much for allowing me to be here. Uh, first, I am a proud mother of twin girls who are two and a half years old, Luna and Estella. So I am at the opposite end of the spectrum as many of you on this call. Um, and my daughter, Luna, has Down syndrome. Um, I'm also an estate planning attorney and I work with parents who have children with special needs and their planning. So as a parent of a child with Down syndrome, one of the most critical issues uh, we are going to face when the child is approaching adulthood and when they become an adult is how to best assist and protect the child when it comes to them um, and their legal, financial, and healthcare decisions. It's the reason we're on this call tonight and the focus of my presentation will be on powers of attorney which are an alternative to a guardianship. So as you know, when your child reaches age 18, the child's no longer a minor and they become legally an adult, which means that the parent has no longer has the legal ability to make decisions for the child. So there are only really two ways that someone can have legal authority to make the decisions on behalf of an adult, and that is through guardianship, which Ashley just spoke on, and the second is powers of attorney. So as we all know, just because your child has Down syndrome doesn't mean that your child lacks the capacity to make and communicate appropriate decisions. So if your child does have sufficient mental capacity to adequately make decisions and protect him or herself, a power of attorney may be the right legal arrangement for your child. On the other hand, if your child does not have sufficient mental capacity to be able to make and communicate appropriate decisions, then guardianship should be considered. So determining whether your child has the capacity to sign a power of attorney really depends on your child's ability to understand what he or she isn't going to be engaging in or what he or she is going to be signing. So what I mean by that is if your child can understand the document they're signing and the ramifications of it, then your child would have the sufficient capacity to sign a power of attorney. So what is a power of attorney? A power of attorney generally is a written document that authorizes someone to act on the person's behalf. The person who is creating the power of attorney is typically called the principal, and the person who is given powers to act on behalf of the principal is the agent. So, for example, a parent, a family member, um, sibling, etc. Powers of attorney are typically created as a durable power of attorney. So, you may have heard the concept of a durable power of attorney. And what a durable power of attorney means is that when um, the child or the adult becomes incapacitated and can no longer make decisions, is determined incompetent, the power of attorney continues to be effective. So a power of attorney can be a guardianship substitute because if the person can no longer make decisions for themselves, the person who's named in the power of attorney, the agent, can continue to make decisions on behalf of that person um, while they're uh, incapacitated and competent. A power of attorney, the scope of a power of attorney is the breadth of the, the powers that the principal gives to the agent. So the powers can be broad in scope or the powers can be limited. 
and it's going to be up to the principal to determine what powers are given or up, uh, what, what powers are given to the agent. So for example, a broad power of attorney would give the agent the ability to make all the decisions the principal, the person creating the power of attorney, could make for himself or herself. So by signing a power of attorney, I think the key thing, the key takeaway to this is that when an adult signs a power of attorney, they're not giving up any of their legal rights, which is what happens when a guardianship is entered into uh, with an adult. So the, the adult child, the adult has still maintains the legal rights to make decisions for themselves. They also just appoint someone, their agent, to be able to make decisions on their behalf. That is the key difference between powers of attorney and guardianship. So powers of attorney clearly are less restrictive than a guardianship. So there are generally two types of powers of attorney. There are financial powers of attorney and there are healthcare powers of attorney. A financial power of attorney grants an agent the ability to make financial decisions, legal decisions on behalf of the principal. So for example, an agent under a financial power of attorney would have the ability to maintain access, bank accounts, add money, withdraw money um, from bank accounts, create new bank accounts, sign tax returns, purchase property, sell property, those types of things. A healthcare power of attorney on the other hand deals with medical decisions. Um, in Ohio, which is where I'm licensed to practice, healthcare powers of attorney become effective when the principal is no longer able to make their own uh, medical decisions. Uh, but one of the key components of a healthcare power of attorney in Ohio is that your healthcare agent does have the ability to access the principal's protected medical records and medical information. So anything that would otherwise be protected by HIPAA with a healthcare power of attorney, the agent would have the ability to access that information. So a healthcare power of attorney doesn't give the healthcare agent the ability to make decisions on behalf of the principal um, effective immediately. It would only give the healthcare agent the ability to make medical decisions if the principal could not answer um, for himself or herself. So powers of attorney are an alternative to guardianship. They're less restrictive. Um, keep in mind if you're considering a power of attorney, you would want to make sure that your um, adult child has the ability to sign a power of attorney so they have the capacity to do so. Um, what I tell clients is why don't you, if you Ha if, if you're starting out in this, why don't you start with a power of attorney and see how far that can take you. And if you feel that your adult child is getting into a situation where they need more protections, then pursue the guardianship route because it's hard to start with a guardianship and then scale back to a power of attorney, but you can always start with a power of attorney and scale up to a guardianship if needed. So that's basically what powers of attorney are um, and some considerations when you're thinking about what next for your adult child. Thank you, Emily, appreciate it. Very clear and good, thank you. Now we'll circle back to Ashley to kind of finish off her part and um, let her go. Do you need to share again, Ashley? You do. I do and I can. Oh, 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 oh. Oh my gosh, what happened? Okay. Wait, Wait, where's your personal emails? I know. Okay, hang on. Well, we'll just go to bear with me. It's my cursor hopped over something. All right. I don't know why I'm just gonna touch it. Okay. Slideshow from current slide. Okay, sorry, I must have hit something. I have a touch screen and it gets kind of funky sometimes on Zoom. All right. So alternatives, in addition to um, 
the powers of attorney, then we can talk about supported decision making. So, you know, a lot of people are just frankly completely unclear about what supported decision making is. Um, so what is it? It is a process by which a person with a disability employs the relationships that he or she has with other people or agencies. So that can be you as family or caregivers, staff, um, a lot of people will do this, you know, at their group home or their, um, the, the organization that is helping them with their living arrangement. Um, volunteers from different organizations. There are organizations that just do supported decision making um, and other advocates. And these people assist them in making decisions and communicating decisions. So we can use a group of people or we can use just one person. And what they do is they ensure that the person has the support system that they need in order to make decisions on that person's behalf. Now, what I say in our family all the time is we go the pace of our slowest family member. So a lot of times that's Jack. You know, Jack is, he, he is extremely fast when he wants to be, but Jack also has ADHD and he will get distracted or he will just be mad or whatever and he'll stop or he will go extremely slowly. Well, we aren't going to blaze through Disneyland because we have Jack and Jack wants to do it slowly. He, it could be sensory processing there, um, but he's part of our family and so we're going to do it with Jack. Um, so, you know, I just realized this is not in slideshow mode. Hang on, I'm, I'm going to try it again. Um, now my cursor is catching up with me. So that's, um, you know, and so if we look at this from doing it, um, let's see if I can make it happen again. I don't know why it's giving us that view. I'm sorry, you guys. I hit something funny. That's not that. All right. Well, it's big enough. Amy, is it going to record okay? Okay, perfect. <laughs> Excuse me. So, you know, we, but my point in telling you that is we form a team and we go um, at the team's pace. And so this concept is kind of a team concept, the supported decision making, right? Like we're not just setting you out into the world and saying, do your best. We're going to come up with a formal plan that talks about how we're going to support you. Yeah, see, now it's going to make me click on each individual slide. I'm sorry. All right. So, what's the process? Okay. So, we first gather a support team, which is family, doctors, related service professionals, whoever, um, and we get all those people together. Then we consider an agreement, and we're going to go through what an agreement looks like. We delegate tasks between the people, and then we re meet regularly, as I talked about, to maintain those relationships, but then also, obviously, to help make decisions. Um, and really, if you think about it, a lot of adults do this anyway. So can I do this in Kentucky, Ohio, or Indiana? Um, Kentucky has actually considered a bill to recognize supported decision making and supported decision making agreements. It failed, but I have a feeling it will come back up. Um, Kentucky's had a lot of time recently. It was just last year and Kentucky's had a lot of um, uh, struggles with their budget recently. So um, we have a really divided Congress in Kentucky. Ohio has the term supported decision making in that organ transplant discrimination bill, which the DSAGC helped bring, um, but it doesn't actually talk about about supported decision making as an alternative to guardianship. It's never been raised otherwise. Um, and I did not realize that until I researched this for this slide. So I'm on our government affairs committee and I'm going to make everybody aware of that because maybe that's something that the DSAGC can do with the government affairs committee. I don't have the kind of power to say we will, but I'll certainly raise it. Um, and then in Indiana, um, we they have actually codified a recognition of supported decision making and supported decision making agreements, which is pretty progressive. Texas was the first. There aren't many that have it. Um, and that was just done in 2019. So that is like excellent in Indiana that they've got a process. Um, where can you find information about supported decision making? Um, you can find information at these links. And so, oh gosh, I'm sorry. It looks like it's 
like in progress or something. Um, so Kentucky has a website. It's called My Choice Kentucky. There are actually forms on Kentucky's um, site if you go to it. And again, they aren't like legally enforceable, but they're very, very helpful if you want to consider that as an option. Indiana has a .gov site because it is codified into Indiana law. So I've given you their site. Um, there is an organization that is called supporteddecisionmaking.org that has a really, really nice website that gives, you know, something that we have to consider, um, and I'm sure Emily talks to state planning clients about this a lot from a Medicaid standpoint and social, secu social security, not so much, but Medicaid waiver standpoint in particular is we are, um, if you want to move to another state, if you want to retire to another state or something, we have to consider what their Medicaid looks like. What do their waivers look like? What does their accessibility look like? What social security look like? Um, and so we, so this national organization provides information on supported decision making for every state in the country. And then it has some good forms and some other good information. So it's a good spot to go. Um, I really like this toolkit. This this organization has a lot of good information. I use them for my um, high school students a lot because they have good information on transition services also. So it's ASAN, Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, and they've got a toolkit on supported decision making that I found pretty helpful. Um, and then because there aren't a whole lot of agreements out there, Texas is, is kind of the controlling one that everybody says, it seems to say is a good one. So if you are interested in supported decision making and want a sample agreement, I've given you the link for Texas's as well. Um, and I can have Amy send these links out in an email or even just the PowerPoint so that you can copy and paste it and not have to type in all of those weird codes as well. Um, but I think you could probably Google it also. So that is a sort of supported decision making in a nutshell. And I'm ready to throw it off to our next speaker. Thanks, Ashley. We really appreciate it. Okay, so now we're going to move on to Ilka Riddle. So Ilka, if you want to go ahead, and I'm going to be helping her share some of her documents. So bear with me too in my maneuvering. Thanks, Ilka. Um, hi, my name is Ilka Riddle, and I'm the director of the Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities at the University of Cincinnati, but I actually sit at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. That's just how the arrangement is made. And um, our university center does a lot of different, tackles a lot of different topics, but one area that I'm very interested in as a director and um, have worked a lot on is the general transition of youth with disabilities into adult life. Um, some of you might be um, familiar with the transition boot camp conference um, that we have been doing for four years now. Unfortunately, last year we couldn't do it. And this year we're still working on a virtual uh, version, but it's going to be different. And one of the topics that we do address is um, guardianship and alternatives to guardianship. Now, my organization um, always looks at um, issues from the perspective of the person with the disabilities and we always want to make sure that people know about the least restrictive um, way to do things for the person with a disability. And tonight what I would like to share with you is just a few resources that I think might be really helpful for family members as well as self-advocates in the process of determining what is the right path for their family. Um, Amy, if you could actually share your screen and show the link that I shared to the National Resource Center for Supported Decision Making. It's actually just a link. Do you have it? I don't think I do. I just physically, okay. I just if you don't have it, yet. I I have it up. If you can um, let me share my screen, I will pull it up. Hold on, just a second. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Gotta give you access. Sorry. There we go. All right. Still don't have access, I think. Yeah, I'm going. I'm doing okay. It. There we go. Yes. I'm going to let you do it. Okay. Okay. 
It should be All right, great. Okay. So you should see now the homepage of the National Resource Center for Supported Decision Making. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, great. So this is actually one of the resources that Ashley just mentioned and gave you um, the links on her slide. So we really like this website because it's in some ways a one-stop shop to help you make decisions around uh, supported decision making and explaining to you what it is. Um, it has some great stories that you can um, view, but what I want you to be aware of is if you go to library and then you go to resource library, that to me is one of the most helpful links on that whole website. And then it kind of walks you through, through supported decision making forms. So it gives you a model agreement that you can review. Um, and it links you to other support tools that are available uh, to you. Um, it also <clears throat> just as, um, as Ashley mentioned, you can go to in your state and just click on your state um, and then see what the current um, situation in your state is. So I find that helpful as well. Um, and so this is full of resources regarding supported decision making. And I think that's um, really helpful for people. So um, I'm going to go uh, get out of this because I want to share some other um, resource with you and let me just since I am screen sharing I think it can go into my folder and pull some things up okay so another tool that I want to share with you is a decision-making checklist and you should be able to see um, the decision-making checklist on my screen now. Yes, we do. Okay, great. So this really is a tool that can help you look at in which areas would my child need like a more restrictive kind of like setup and in which area does my child um, need something or would need something le less restrictive. And you can then at the end look at like, where do we come out as a family and what does that maybe help us or may mean for us in terms of making our decision about guardianship or supported decision making um, with power of attorney. So you can go through these. So uh, it's sometimes also called the stoplight tool because it is like um, similar to a stoplight. So you look through the questions and you think about your child and you kind of like check where your child falls within that specific area of decision making. So it looks at employment, it looks at money management, it looks at health and nutrition, relationships, personal safety, community living, personal decision making, directing services and supports. So at the end, you can really, as a family, and I think it's really important, maybe I, I haven't said that yet. I think it's really important for a family to kind of come together and make the decision together, and most certainly with a child who has a disability to the greatest extent possible, so that it really is a decision that everybody can agree to. Um, and then I think it's a very personal decision. What is the right choice for for a family. Um, but I think it is really important to really make it a process and look at different tools and resources to make a very informed decision, simply because guardianship is more restrictive than some of the other options that are also available. But not for some families, that's certainly the right way to go. So this is a really helpful tool, I think. Um, I'm going to go to one other tool. So there's actually something called the practical tool for lawyers, um, steps in, supported, in supporting decision making. Um, but you don't have to be a lawyer at all to benefit from this form. Um, and I don't know if, um, Ashley, if you have seen that form or 
Um, so it's, it's called the practical tool for lawyers. Um, and so it really helps lawyers if you're working with a lawyer who may not be as familiar with the processes, which you shouldn't, but it can help in that situation. But again, I think it can be helpful if you go through these questions with family members or other people who might be able to support your child to kind of help with the overall decision making. So again, it is just another tool to look at like, what type of supports does my child need? Where is my child more independent? Where is my child less independent? Where would they need help, like complete help? Where would they be able to do some things? And again, it can help you in the process of making the decision. So I want you to be aware of these tools and I send um, the tools themselves um, actually to um, Rosie and I think Amy has them. So you certainly um, can get those tools and use them. I also wanted to share a tool that is specifically was developed for yeah, teenagers and young adults. Do you see the tool? No, nope. okay, let's try this again. Now you should see it. Yep, there it is. Okay, so this is like a plain language um, form that um, a youth or young adult can fill out with a family member to look at like, where am I independent? Where do I need support? Um, what are the areas where I might still work on becoming more independent and can become more independent? Or what are the, where are the areas where I really need more help um, or have somebody else do it for me? Again, that is, can be something that family members can do with the teenager or young adult, and they can fill it out themselves to kind of also share their perspective on where they feel they need maybe support or where they feel like I can do this. And then again, ideally, it would be a family decision to determine what's best. And I think sometimes we get questions about the supported decision making. A lot of times, and I don't know, Ashley, you might get those questions too. People are really afraid that supported decision making is not going to um, protect a, a young adult or an adult as much as guardianship would. Um, and that somebody could easily take advantage of the young adult or the adult um, in life with just having supported decision making, um, especially if it's not has no legal kind of like connection and it's just an agreement that the family um, came up with. Um, I think sometimes we, we, we share with families there are certain things you can put in place. And that can still protect your child. Like for example, we have some families that have a debit card where their child can use the debit card, but the maximum you can get out on that debit card is $100. So even if somebody else kind of wanted to take advantage of them, there wouldn't be a loss of like thousands of dollars. Things like that um, can be put in place um, to, to protect and support the adult in their independence. So I think that's important to know. I think the other piece that I just wanted to mention is that sometimes we hear from families that they went to the hospital, to the emergency room, their child is 19 years old, they don't have guardianship. And the hospital says like, oh, we can't ha share any information with you on your child's um, health, which isn't to, which isn't true. There is a way um, for your child to sign a paper that actually will then allow you to be part of decision making um, and for you to have access or get access to information that your adult child wants you to share or wants to share with you. So there are certain protections that you can put in place um, that legally protect you and or your child um, without having full guardianship. So I just wanted to mention that as well. Um, there are some other tools. Um, there are also some examples similar to what Ashley had said earlier with the links that um, Amy can share with you guys. Um, just the general like kind of advanced directives and um, um, 
kind of documents. Um, and then I just real quick, and I know we want to have time for the parents to share. There's a supported decision making agreement that is very simple, but can help in the process of determining how we're going to set up as a family or as a circle of friends the supports for the adult. All right. So I think that's all I have for the moment. And with that, I would like to give it up to the next speaker. Thank you, Elka. We really appreciate it. Uh, I know that people are going to want copies of all those things, and um, we'll get we'll get everything out to all the attendees here, along with the link of the recording. So just give us a few days to compile all of that, everyone. Okay. So next, we move on to our parent experts. Uh, Carol, are you in a good place to start? You're still muted. There we go. Hi, I'm Carol. I am mom to Jake, who turned 18 in May. And um, just like Ashley's presentation on guardianship, it was very easy. Um, just we got the paper. I mean, I was very intimidated about doing the whole guardianship, thinking I'm going to be pulling out my hair, but it was very easy. Um, my caseworker, actually from North Key through Michelle P, gave me all the information I needed. And I pretty well filled it out, went to the clerk's office, and she assigned a pre-trial date for me. Um, and at that pre-trial, I got to meet the attorney. And at that point, Jake was also declared a poor person, so we wouldn't have to pay for like the psychologist or the attorney. And I know some parents in the um, area have used the school psychologist instead of being appointed one. Um, so that is an option there. And then um, our pediatrician filled out the paperwork and we had a social worker go to the school. And after that, you know, we had a trial date and we were, you know, done in 15 minutes. So it was very, very easy. Um, I'm glad we did it early because Jake has a May birthday, but I had it done by January because who knows what, if, what would have happened with the COVID. Um, so I'm glad we did it early on that point. Um, and we did guardianship only because Jake is not mature enough to make his own decisions. So that was our choice and I think it's a good one. And I know eventually we can always change that, which would be good for him. But right now, you know, being 18 and probably being an only child, that doesn't help in um, him being too mature to do and make the right decisions. Um, so yeah, it was easy. I'm glad we did it. And, you know, I don't, yeah, that's all I have, I guess. Thank you, Carol. Thank you for sharing. Um, I did type in the chat, just so you all know, Carol does live in Kentucky. So her perspective is from the great state of Kentucky. Uh, now we'll move on to, I think, did we decide Nithya was going to speak next? I think we did. Nithya, are you ready? Yes. And hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad to be back in Cincinnati, <laughs> virtually. <laughs> um, so I don't have guardianship. I have a 20-year-old son um, who has Down syndrome. I don't have guardianship. Um, he, We have... Um, set up the healthcare power of attorney, the financial power of attorney and everything. Um, I just wanted to share with you a couple of scenarios, um, you know, in, um, you know, doing things um, like social security. He gets a social security income um, and uh, they have like random assessments every now and then. So what we have, the, and usually uh, the mail comes home, um, they have like predetermined appointments, set timings, um, and the last time we couldn't make it. So I just like took all the documents that we needed 
um, I just took Vineet with me and we both went, to our social security office is like just very close by. So we just went in there and then there was a name, a caseworker's name, and then we kind of tried to meet her. And she said, oh, this is like a random assessment that we do every now and then. And, you know, it'll just take a few minutes. And it ended up being 20 minute, 25 minute um, questionnaire. But again, it's like simple questions. They ask we need like, you know, what's, where do you live? What's your name? Who lives in your home? And um, all those things. And, and you know, I, the questions kind of like start those simple. And then, it, and then she was like, oh, are you a felon? Um, have you committed felony? And that's where like he stumbled, right? You know, who knows the word felon? He doesn't know what felon means. And then she said like, it's okay, you can ask your mom. So I think this is how it plays supported decision making in like life. Um, you know, it's okay, you can ask your mom and you know, she can help you to determine what that is and you know, you can answer. So that's how we kind of like um, manage the situations. It's been pretty easy with social security. It's never been a problem. Um, he does get a Medicaid card. Um, I had to change, uh, we had to change managed care recently. Um, so every time we call the number, he will um, talk to them, uh, say hello, and then um, he has a poor speech intelligibility. So then they don't understand what he's trying to say. And then they'll ask him, is it okay if I talk to your mom? And then I had to change the insurance and that's when I just pick up the phone. I just kind of like chime in and say like, I need to change insurance and we want to change to Keystone. So um, so this is the financial aspect of it. He, we have a joint account. Um, he, has a, uh, he has a bank account, but it's, we, it's like a joint account. Um, so the social security directly goes to his bank account. Um, so we are not a representative payee. Um, for that as well. It just goes to his bank account. He has a debit card. Um, and in the healthcare setting too, I think we have been very, very um, happy uh, with how things really work. Um, in the doctor's office, um, he kind of like, you know, goes in, signs in, he starts talking about his problems, um, you know, if he's sick or something. Um, and then they are very open with like talking to me about like, you know, and then we kind of make the decision like together. And I think um, both Ilka and Ashley shared national supported decision making. They're in the search library, um, Jonathan Martinez has clearly, he has a very good video that you all kind of can watch on to. He explains like how the supported decision making works. And that's how it's been working for us. Like we kind of make the decision together. Um, I think everybody is, although it's like the agreement is not like formal, uh, we have been seeing that like, you know, everybody is recognizing the supported decision making. And then he clearly explains, like if I have to do an elective surgery, I, have, I will be coming back home discussing with my husband it's the same scenario. I mean, if, you know, if he, we need to make a decision or he has to have a surgery, we all sit together and kind of like make that decision together. Um, and, you know, we help him understand what's going on. Um, he has had surgeries, he has signed his own um, surgery release forms, anesthesia forms. Um, again, we talk to him about what's happening, what's going to happen, what to expect. Um, and then um, the, the, the physicians also recognize the fact that like, you know, it's, it's like they help him understand it's okay if you don't ask, you can ask help, uh, I mean, uh, help, we can talk to your mom, uh, we can make that decision together. And it's really played out very um, well. Um, we have really not had any situations where we have to um, be uh, concerned about. Um, people are beginning to really recognize the supported decision-making and the individual making it his own, this, her or her own decisions. Um, they really respect that and they sit and work with the family and um, it's played out very well. 
Um, yeah, I think that's the, those are the scenarios. I think supported decision making happens on you know every day, right? We are always making decisions. We are um, um, you know talking to our family members about like you know how do we do that and how do we decide on what what to do and stuff like that. So it kind of it's a scenario that happens every day on a day to day basis in every decisions that we make. It's nothing different. Um, but I think in settings like social security and, you know, typical doctor's office or surgeries, people are beginning to recognize um, to support decision making. Um, so it really plays out very well. So that's what I had. Hey, Nithya, we're glad to see you back. <laughs> All right, and our last speaker tonight is Connie. Are you ready, Connie? All righty. Hi, I am Connie Hutzel. I have a 24 year old typical son and Carson, my son with Down syndrome is 23. Uh, we have guardianship of Carson and we got that when, when he was 18. He um, has verbal apraxia, so he's very hard to understand, sometimes even for me. So I didn't think that he would be able to communicate his needs and wants out in the world and, and do that very successfully. You know, if he, if he had the capacity of, like, uh, the young adults that were on uh, the Born in This Way show, no problem, I would do the supported living, but that's just not where Carson is. So we have guardianship, and and um, I'll tell you, you know, this kind of hit home when my typical son was in college and ended up in the hospital, and uh, uh, one of his friends called and said, do you know that Cole's in the hospital? And so then I called the hospital, but they couldn't give me any information because he was over 18. So... Those of you with kids in college, you might want to at least get a healthcare power of attorney so that you can get information. Um, what for us, it, it means, um, it, it's kind of a safety net for us with Carson is, you know, we, we let him have choices, but maybe choices within limits. And then um, like uh, Ashley was saying, you know, part of it is saying no, because for quite a while, Carson wanted to go to Japan and was just, Deb said I'm going to Japan because he wanted to go look for Power Rangers or Pokemon or who knows what. But, you know, we're, we're not going to go to Japan to go look for Power Rangers. So part of it is saying no. Um, one thing I do is I carry the guardianship papers. It's like a little double-sided page that, like, if we go on a trip or uh, uh, different doctors and things like that, I'll carry it with me. I've never had to show it, but it. For me, it's kind of a safety net knowing that if they question anything that I had that with me. Usually if I just say I'm his guardian, everybody is okay, which I kind of think is funny that they don't even question that, but whatever, you know. So anyway, I if you get guardianship, I would suggest carrying the papers with you just, just for safety's reasons. Um, another thing I recommend is like Ilka was saying that the transition boot camp, those, those seminars are so informative of all the different things and not just guardianship but the transition I, for for me um for me when Carson was little I learned all that I could about school well first when he was born you know you learn what you can about Down syndrome then they go to school and you learn about school and different you know school related things learning learning styles and all that kind of stuff and and I felt like I was pretty educated about all this all the way through Carson's schooling but man when that transition hit it <laughs> there's just a lot of stuff that you guys need to know and for me it was um I have to hear things sometimes more than one time so with there there was kind of a checklist that I had and and so I would go and listen to these di different transition fairs and or um they would have fairs or they would have different talks of uh, just around town but you would hear one topic and then you would hear it again. It's like, okay, I think I kind of know what I'm supposed to do for that one. And then, then you kind of check that one off and you move to the next one. So my advice for, for those of you in transition is to, uh, you know, just get as much information as you can and take advantage of the, the learning opportunities that are out there because there's, there's a lot of stuff to, to learn. I, I felt like for Carson schooling, it was like this much of his life, but then for, the rest of it after that transition is like this much. So there's a lot of stuff to learn. Let me, let me tell you that. Um, so this is another thing too, is search the web for 
different information about guardianship. And I would start with either your DODD. Um, for, for Ohio, it's done by counties. I don't know exactly how it is in, in Kentucky, if it's statewide or counties, but for Ohio, every county has their own website. And so go, don't just restrict yourself to your county's website because different counties have great information. I pulled this up from Warren County where we live. Um, it's a guardianship, understanding your role as guardian and it's a, like a guardianship handbook, but that actually was not from the DOD website. The other website you need to, or the, the place you wanna look is the probate court website because they usually have some kind of handbook and they also have the, the guardianship forms that you need to fill out. So go to your probate, your county probate courts website and you'll be able to find some stuff. Um, let's see, you know, when, when Ashley was, after I was asked to do this and, and and talk here, and then some of the people like Nithya are on the supported lip, the supported um, decision making. Like, man, maybe we've re we've restricted Carson too much, but we don't we don't make every decision for him, and we're not uh, we're not joined at the hip. He he stays here by himself. He makes decisions by himself, and this and that. Like I said, for us, it's just kind of a safety net. But then all the checklists that Ilka was going through, I'm like, yeah, we made the right decision because it, it, it you know he he's very independent with with um, hygiene and showering and that kind of stuff, doesn't need any help. But if he were to go out and um, he, he doesn't have concept of, he has concept of money, but he doesn't have really the concept of if things are really not a very good deal. For example, um, he'll find he'll find things out on the internet. He likes these little Power Ranger keys. And, and at one time they were a three pack at Toys R Us for like $7. Well, they don't make them anymore. So now they'll sell one of them for, um, like fifty dollars, and, and he'll want it. It's like, no, nah, that's not really a very good deal. Uh, but some things I, you know, like I said, the choice is within in limits. So some things I'll be like, yeah, it's not a good deal, but it's not a horrible deal. So yeah, we'll go for that one. But you know, like I said, the choice is within limits is usually what I kind of kind of base it on. So um, I'm looking at my notes here, and I really, uh, you know, the uh, the other thing too is. He, he stays home quite a bit by himself when before COVID hit and I was in the office, I probably was gone at least eight hours a day, maybe nine or so. And he's perfectly capable of being here and uh, making a simple lunch or I'll, I'll set stuff out and he can, you know, he works the microwave and that kind of stuff. I fully expect him to be independently. No, that's not right. <laughs> living on his own with supports in place is necessary, but not living with us all the time. Like maybe in about three or four years, he'll be moving out on his own. We'll probably still be his guardian, but we won't even be, he won't even be living with us anymore. So we'll just kind of be there as a, again, as a safety net to make sure that the other thing, other, other people and other supports in place are, are doing what they need to do. So, um, and he's voted, he's voted in, in the, the last uh, presidential election and, and the last, um, I think it was a primary and, and I am able to go in with him and I kind of read the questions and, and the, the people and, you know, we, we talked about it beforehand. And so again, um, you know, does he vote the way I would vote? Probably, you know, it, it's not my choice. It's his choice. So um, I think that I, that's really all I can think of about the guardianship. But uh, like I said, try to find out as much information as you can go to your DOGD website county website and go to your county probate website and and also other county websites within your state or even in the country because they have different um different packets out there that you just might find helpful so i think that's about it thank you so much connie thank you and thank you to all the parents for sharing your experience um Really, I mean, speaking as a parent, I'd love to hear from other parents and know what, you know, went into your decision making. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, we you, Thank you all, to all the panelists. Em, um, Emily had to um, head out, but we have everyone else here. There were no other chat questions other than asking to share the information that um, you guys were sharing on your screen. So... Um, we do have some time left, about 10 minutes within that 8.30 time, if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask. This could get a little confusing if too many people have a lot, but um, 
we will try and remember that we are recording. So whatever you ask and however you ask it will be on the recording that we share broadly. Um, so if anyone has a question, you can raise your hand or unmute yourself and we'll try that and we'll go from there. Anyone? Amy, I think there's a question from Julie in the text Julie. in the chat box. I, oh. Yeah, I Sorry. saw it and I can answer it. Amy, she just sent it while you're talking. Well, thank you. Go. So Julie's question is, we often hear that it is difficult to undo guardianship if it isn't wanted later in life. Can I address that? Um, so it's not, it's kind of like getting a guardianship. It's not super hard to undo a guardianship if um, it is uncontested. And so um, it, it's harder to undo a guardianship if there's somebody that is there to testify that the guardianship is needed, um, just like getting a guardianship. But I, I think the, the probably path of lesser resistance would be to try it, to turn 18, try some decision making, see what happens. One thing I didn't say about guardianship is if you um, want to try supported decision making or just adult life with powers of attorney, et cetera, then what I would, um, it, it, it kind of the fallback is you can always get an emergency guardianship pretty quickly. I have a friend that had to do that um, and you know she had had cancer and she um, did as an adult and she did that with her mother's support. The second time she had cancer, she said, I'm not getting treatment. And it was very treatable and whatnot, but she needed to have a port placed and she refused placement of the port at the hospital. They simply scheduled it for the next day. They went down to probate court. They got the emergency guardianship. They got the medical treatment. Once all of that was taken care of, they got to court and they got the, the full permanent guardianship, which was absolutely fine. So emergency guardianship is available also. Um, the next question is, have any parents done any powers of attorney? Yeah, I was just answering her, Nitya here. Yeah, I have just done the powers of attorney. Um, so we have a healthcare power of attorney, the financial power of attorney. Um, in fact, there was um, the lawyer, we lived in Cincinnati for a long time. So the um, lawyer in downtown set it up. So um, we made the decision uh, kind of like six to eight months before started thinking about this. Um, so that like all the paperwork would be ready in place so on his 18th birthday, 9.30 in the morning, we were in downtown office signing five, and he was signing his financial power of attorney and healthcare power of attorney. So yes, um, that's what we have. And advanced directives are very similar to what like set up for the whole family, like, you know, for me and my husband, whatever that is, it's very similar to that. Um, is what we have set up for Vineet as well. Um, and those are just the documents that we have. And the other thing that I wanted to, and we knew about this, the emergency um, guardianship that we could get. Um, that's one thing that I was aware of. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to share was, I think you can also, um, um, you know, in the portal, the health portal, when you have the my chart or something, when you have with your provider, you can actually, um, 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 you know, upload your, um, his like Vineet's power of attorney. So that like in an hospital, usually in an emergency or hospital, they, I mean, they can, he can say like, you can talk to my mom, my parents, and they'll talk to us. But you know, in 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 you know in, in in scenarios, if we're not in the regular hospital or something, if that pulls up in the my chart or my my um, chart or his his file that there is a power of attorney, um, then you know that will be kind of like safer too. So that is something that you can do. Um, upload that to the um, my chart account. Can I add something too? This is not related to the power of attorney, but I forgot to say for us, we just have guardianship of Carson's person. We don't have guardianship of his estate because um, one, he doesn't have tons of money, but uh, from what I understand of guardianship of the estate, you have to keep pretty meticulous records of what they spend and what they don't spend. And 
And so um, I, he does get social security. I am his representative's payee, but I don't have guardianship of his estate. And also I wanted to mention too, is like Ashley said, um, usually you can file, I think it's, she, she's probably right that it's about $300 or less, but I'm pretty sure that if you declare the person that you're getting guardianship of as indignant, I think that's the word, that they will waive the court costs or the filing fee. So something to keep in mind for that. Yeah. yeah. And that's the same, that's what Carol was saying about the guardian ad litem fee as well. You don't, you don't pay the guardian ad litem fee if you're, um, if the person is indigent and they have to be indigent if they're also going to qualify for Medicaid. So, in social security. Right. So. so, Ashley, do you want to answer to Mary, like how STM is actually not a setup agreement in Ohio and Kentucky? Yeah, so um, supported decision making is um, not the power of attorney. Um, it, it, you could do both, but supported decision making is um, what a power of attorney does is it simply gives you access to um, your child's records. And then if the child becomes incapable of making decisions for themselves, then just like us, um, then you could make them. So like, you know, if I, I've got power of attorney for my husband for healthcare, and what it says is if he becomes incapable of making decisions for himself, then I can make decisions for him. And I usually explain to people that can be short term or long term. So it could be that he sustains a traumatic brain injury and it's long term and I am making decisions for him. You know, he's got a TBI and then he develops diabetes. Well, then I'm, I'm the one that says, yes, okay, let's go ahead and give him an insulin pump or something like that. It could be short term, like he has a heart attack and, um, you know, they have to put him on ice for three weeks or something and I'm making the decisions about how much ice, I don't know, whatever. Maybe he needs a toenails cut in the hospital. And I make those decisions. Um, and then, you know, and then he's able to come back out of that um, cognitive impairment that's kind of secondary to the heart attack in that case. Um, Supported decision making is a plan that you enter um, into that, again, is not legally enforceable in Kentucky or Ohio yet, but it is um, kind of like that checklist that Ilka shared that suggests this is who's going to help me make these decisions and this is how I'm going to make decisions, etc. So they can coincide, but they are not the same thing. Um, can, can I interject to that? Whoever asked uh, what indignant meant, they, they're right that it means poor, that they don't have any income. Um, but the, the, the form that is a little bit hard is the form from the doctor, from the um, professional, the, it could be a psychologist or whatever, but it does have to be a form of incompetence. Doesn't that sound right, Ashley? The, um, the, the professional form is kind of a form of, so you're kind of declaring your child incompetent when you're getting guardianship. Yes, yes. And right. that was one thing that I was going to say, um, and I'll go back and answer your follow up, Mary. But um, one thing that's really hard is a lot of us spend our lives saying what our children can do. Um, and, you know, really advocating for them to be um, it, not only accepted or tolerated, but loved and um, really appreciated. And a guardianship hearing is really hard <laughs> because, you know, you hear people talk about all of the questions that they couldn't answer. And um, I was in one where they use the R word. Um, it is very, very, very difficult to sit through one, even if it isn't your child. So be prepared for that. If you are kind of, you know, especially if you are um, one of those celebrate include kind of people because you are saying that your child's incompetent. Um, I know we're short on time now, but I want to go back um, and answer Mary's question because that's a good one that I don't think we raised. Um, so can you only get a power of attorney before, can you get one before you're 18? No. An adult, you, you can't sign a power of attorney until you're an adult. So you turn an adult at 18. Once you're emancipated, um, once you're an adult, then you can sign that document. And that is true of people with and without disabilities. Um, so like your, you know, typical children can't do it before they go to college unless they're 18. Okay, any other questions? 
or Amy might say, don't ask that. It's 8.30. Let them go. I don't see any other questions coming in or anyone else. You know, you know um, this is something I was surprised about too. <laughs> Quiet. But I was surprised that they're actually, um, you know, Ashley, you were mentioned, you know, that, that the kids aren't, you know, you're saying that they might not be loved and that kind of stuff. We're parents and we're getting their guardianship. Yes, we have, you know, we're loving them, whatever. But I was surprised that there actually are paid guardianship guardians for like people that don't have family or people that don't have anybody that, or, or their family doesn't want to be a guardian or whatever. There, there are organizations that might have 60 wards or whatever they would be. I, I think they're called wards of the state or whatever uh, that they are the guardians for. And attorneys too. So you could, you could turn, I don't know if um, like, I don't know if you could do it with the point or with a layout, but you can do it to organizations like the point and layout, um, places that have multiple housing settings. Um, there are attorneys that are guardians for a lot of people. Most of them choose elderly people as kind of their forte. It's kind of hard to find somebody that would want to do it for an adult with a um, developmental disability, but it is possible. Um, the and then there are also landlords that do it and those are really things to be careful of so kind of a, a warning and that's totally a generalization i am sure there are landlords that are great but um there are landlords that buy multi um unit buildings and then and they do it because they can take section 8 housing you know the housing subsidies are are always going to be paid. The government's always going to pay you. A person might not pay you because their job is gone or whatever. And so they um, open them only to take the government subsidy. And then they say, and I'll become your guardian. And then like everybody only gets $50 a week or something like that. I get a few of those calls a year and they're usually pretty egregious. So that's something that I would caution people of um, if they're looking for housing. All right, well, we're going to go ahead and, and close it out because an hour and a half is a lot of time and information to absorb. Thank you so much to everybody, all of our um, panelists that came here, the parents, um, Connie and Nithya and Carol, thank you, and Ashley, Emily, who's gone, and Ilka. Uh, thank you guys so much for being a part of this panel. Big thank you to Rosie and to Carol again for um, for making this happen for everyone because you know everything things happen like this stem from a question you know somebody in the group says hey what about this I want to know more about it and incredible leaders that I have recruited <laughs> um, you know act on it and get this together so uh, thank you so much to everybody that was here uh, listening as well um, I just, you know, it just, it warms my heart to see a lot of people here tonight to um, benefit from so many people's expertise and their experiences. So, uh, like I said earlier, we will gather the information that the panelists shared. We will get that out to you guys. We will also do the link to the recording and everyone have a very good night and stay well. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Bye. Thanks everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.